to ease the heart of Amir al-Mu'mineen and Umm al-Baneen sallallahu alayhi wa alayha and alayhi salam kindly offer a salawat ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad Allahumma sallam ala أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أب القاسم المصطفى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المأسومين المذلومين واللعنة الله على أعدائهم من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين وصلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا لفارات الحسين يا حجة الله يا ابن الحسن يا صاحب الأسر والزمان اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجل فرج My dearest elders, brothers, sisters, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Yesterday we reminded ourselves that death is a reality الموت حق Death is truth And we said that the type of journey that one goes on after they've experienced death through until they're resurrected and even beyond is massively dictated by how pure our soul is whilst working on it in this life. We learned of the example of the mother of the commander of the faithful, Fatima bint Asad, being given glad tidings by the angels after successfully answering her questions, who is your Lord, who is your prophet, who are your imams, etc. We also learn that Amir al-Mu'mineen would be speaking with those pure souls who were in Barzakh but meeting spiritually in Wadi salam And I'm sure after yesterday all of us in this room would have probably said I want to be in that camp and not in the camp of the other description of Barzakh and perhaps if we make the right decisions in these days and the right conviction We'll never have to think about that part of Barzakh ever again, but we should always have khawf and raja as we've mentioned. Therefore today I thought it would be apt that we look at how can we purify our soul. What does it need from us practically and actively in this life to go about purifying this soul that we've spoken about so much? Interestingly, we're told in the Qur'an that God's purpose in appointing the Holy Prophet was that souls would thereafter be able to be purified. God summarizes the Prophet's duties as being to convey his signs to them, humankind, and to purify and educate them on the book and wisdom. This was one of the primary goals of the Holy Prophet to come and tell mankind and teach mankind how to purify our souls so we can live the best of this world and the best of the eternal world. To see the other side of this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala considers corruption of the soul to be the essential element of failure. And in a surah known as Surah to Shams, the surah of the sun, where if you want to remember how to know the number, I remember being taught this years ago and it still sticks with me. If you want to know the surah number of Surah to Shams, whilst including Pluto, there are nine planets, so that's the nine. And there's one Shams, which is one. Surah number 90, one. So hopefully if there's one thing you take away from these 10 lectures, it's this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this surah, he swears by many things. And in verse 7 he says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, wa nafsin wa ma sawaha. And by the soul and the one who fashioned it. فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا Then within, then with the knowledge of right and wrong inspired it. قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَا Successful indeed is the one who purifies their soul. وَقَدْ خَابَ مَنْ دَسَّاهَا And doomed is the one who corrupts it. So many reminders in the Qur'an and in Hadith to say, look, go and purify this soul. Go and purify it. Protect it. 
it will be your means to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore today inshallah, again through the works of Sayyid Fadil Milani who I think we found uh, a dear scholar that you all resonate with inshallah if you found the content in the last few days to be useful and all credit is to him for his hard work and endeavors to present it in such a beautiful fashion he presents this topic in the following ways firstly we're going to try and understand in a little bit more detail what the soul actually is when we talk about the soul what are we actually specifically referring to from that we'll understand that there is a very important need to care for it to nourish it then we'll be instructed on three practical ways on how we can go about caring for it and nourishing it. And finally, we'll learn of three categorizations of the soul to understand where we're currently at with ours. And finally, we'll then speak of the man who truly controlled his soul on the day of Karbala. Kindly offer a salawat ala Muhammadin wa Ali Muhammad. And a second salawat in honor of Bab al Hawaij Abu al Fadl al Abbas alayhi salam. <laughs> Yesterday we mentioned that each human is made up of three different elements the body, the spirit, and the soul. The body is as we know it, this physical thing that biologically exists both within us and animals and eventually rots away after a period of time. We then said that the soul, the spirit, is something that at the moment we die is removed from us. That's it, it's over. When the spirit leaves the body, it's over. The, the, the soul is something slightly different. Well, not slightly, very different actually. So what is the relation between the soul and the spirit? They work together, firstly, it's important for us to understand. The spirit, or to use the Arabic terminology, the ruh. We see in the Quran, Allah blows the ruh into us. It's blown into the human body around roughly, many scholars kind of agree that it's roughly around the fourth month of pregnancy. It's the attribute whose presence registers the existence of life. Once the ruh is inserted into the body, at that point life now exists. Once the ruh is taken away from the body, life no longer exists in this body. That is the role of the ruh. When it's not present, there's absence of life. When it's present, it's there. The life is good. The soul covers a lot more than that. A much broader area of function. When you use the terms like conscience that you have from within you, your inner conscience, when you know what's between right and wrong even before anyone's taught you it, when you know that being held by your mother feels right, that is your inner conscience. No one's taught you it, you're a baby. Your willpower, your personality, your cognitive ability, your inner awareness and reflection, your ability to assess and see the unseen. Every other spiritual aspect that exists within you is as a result of your soul. Now, we typically translate the word soul into Arabic as nafs, which you may have come across. However, nafs has two parts. Nafs is made up of the aql, the intellect, and also shahwa, lust and desires. And our goal in life is that we want our aql to supersede, to overtake, to always win over our shahwa. Shahwa, these lowly desires that I've mentioned during these nights, these are hawa on nafs, this I want to backbite, I want to be famous, I want money, I want lust, I want this, that is our lonely desires, that is our shahwa speaking, that exists in all of us. And if channeled in the right ways, in the right moments, it is healthy. But it can overcome us, and that is where we want our intellect to win that battle and to guide us towards what is right. That is called the nafs, the soul, the makeup of those two things, and we want our soul to have the intellect beat the shahwa. When the spirit departs the body, death occurs. However, at that point, the soul continues to exist. When someone passes away, the spirit is taken away from them. That person, almost within an instant, by their own family members, is no longer referred to as their father, but is now referred to as the body. 
within seconds. Whilst that heartbeat monitor's still going, they say, how's dad doing? The moment the heartbeat monitor stops, when do we get the body? Frightening how quick we change. The spirit is removed, the body eventually decomposes, but the soul remains. And the soul continues to reflect on the good and evil that it's committed in this life. The soul is better defined as the principle of thought and action in a person, that challenge between shahwa and intellect and aql that we just mentioned. It's an entity that is distinct from the body. It's a person's spiritual nature. That is when we talk about your spiritual nature, we're referring to the quality of your nafs. It is the center of consciousness and awareness. When someone sleeps, what's happening? Their body is remaining. Their ruh is still in there giving it life, so long as Allah deems it. But the soul can travel. And that is why you experience dreams. The soul can travel time and space. And that is why you can experience dreams. The soul can go and see the unseen world if it is so pure. So there is a clear need for us to care for this soul. If it's the thing that's going to outlive us for eternity, the body we should be less concerned about arguably. The spirit Allah inserts and removes and that's kind of like our battery if you like. The soul, the nafs, is something that continues. But how many of us care for it? Frighteningly, when we look at the physical body, none of us ever want to be in public without having had a shower especially in the heat of Karachi. We look after it, the body is well looked after. Cleanliness through showering, beautification through creams and makeup and perfume and clothes and all sorts. And the obvious question that then gets asked is, if our body is going to decompose and our soul is going to continue to exist, to what extent are we nourishing, beautifying, perfuming, fragranting our souls? We'd never want to walk through mud or the floods deliberately. But when it comes to our soul, we're willing to put it into murky spiritual dangers without even thinking twice and frighteningly asking, are you sure this is dangerous for me? Or just how dangerous is it for me? We invest thousands of pounds into the beautification of our body, but truly, how many pounds do we invest in the beautification of our soul? How many hours do I spend combing my hair? How many hours do I spend combing through the illegitimate desires of my soul to get rid of that shahwa? We barely invest, what, 10% of that? Fun thing is 30% of statistics are made up, so, you know, could be more, could be less. But if you're interested, the global industry spend on beauty products in 2020 was $483 billion, and it's set to rise by 2025 to $716 billion. Just as a nice little side fact. It's frightening how much we neglect our soul, but look after our body. We've got our priorities so much the wrong way around. Amir al-Mu'mineen compares these two aspects of beauty and he's reported to say inner beauty is finer than the ephemeral outer beauty, meaning something that lasts for a very short time. So I'll rephrase it. Inner beauty is finer than the outer beauty that lasts for a very, very short time. And when we discover that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala advises us to only enter mosques when we've got the appropriate attire, we're embellished with the adornment of prayer, we typically think that this is an external beautification. But in reality, the advice of Allah when entering these mosques is as much physical as it is spiritual. There's always a combination. And when it comes to our physical bodies, we don't just think about beautification. That implies that the body is in a good shape, good form, and now we're adding certain layers, perhaps for that wedding, or perhaps for that birthday party, or perhaps for that dinner. What is actually happening to that body and what we're doing every single day subconsciously without even realizing it is that when ensuring it's nourished, 
We're ensuring that this body is getting the right fuel every single day. Eating these foods, drinking those fluids, even before you get a headache, you make sure that you have enough hydration within you, especially when it's hot outside. To what extent on a day to day are we nourishing our soul? Let alone beautifying it, just nourishing it, just keeping the fuel in the car, just keeping the body moving, just keeping the soul alive. But the question may come, what is the nourishment of the soul? The nourishment of the body is food and water. The nourishment of the car is fuel. The nourishment of the soul, we're told, Surely in the remembrance of Allah do hearts find comfort. That's your fuel. That's your battery pack. Amir al-Mu'mini reported to say the remembrance of Allah is nourishment for the soul. In another hadith, he's reported to say it is the remembrance of Allah that keeps shaitan away. Those who therefore infrequently remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are truly neglectful of their soul's need for nourishment. They don't even care twice about it. They don't even think about it. It's not important for them. It's as if they're not giving their body food and water. The intellectual individual will tell you, you need to eat. The spiritual intellectual person will tell you, your soul needs to eat. It needs the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if we don't do it, it has a dire consequence, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala walks, it warns about in the Quran in Surah number 20, verse number 124. But whoever turns away from my reminder, my remembrance, will certainly have a miserable life then we will raise them up blind on the day of judgment. You're not going to enjoy your life if you have a lack of perfection in it. And when the only source of perfection is Allah, if it's not part of your life, you're not going to enjoy it. It's as simple as that. So practically, what can we actually do to take care of our soul to ensure we truly journey towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and find perfection in this life? and forevermore. And if you would like these pieces of advice, can you offer a salawat ala Muhammadin wa Ali Muhammad? The first practical advice that Sayyid Father Milani derives from our teachings of Ahlul Bayt alayhim wassalam in the Quran comes from these two ayahs, which are succinct, yet so vital for us to imprint in our souls and in our minds and in our everyday. And you know what? Print posters of this around your house. One of our exec coaches, executive coaches in the business, whenever he comes, he looks at our walls and he's like, your walls tell your employees what to be thinking about and how to frame their mind when they come in. We used to have a picture of Darth Vader, like the, the baddie from Star Wars, if you like. And he was like, do you really want people coming into your office being on the dark side or on your side? Or are you telling them that you're on the dark side? You want positivity on the walls. You want inspiration. You want employees who have done phenomenally well. You want them to be in a state of mind where it says clients come first and they're constantly client centric. Quality over speed, maybe. What concepts do you want in your family's walls? to encourage them to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Perhaps these two ayahs could give you inspiration. The first one is from 9614. Does he not know that Allah sees all? You want to know how to nourish your soul? Keep in mind that Allah sees all. A second ayah, 57.4. He is with you wherever you may be. He sees everything and he's with you. He sees you. He's with you. He's everywhere. We've been asking if you can, please take a moment to try and come as far forward. Brothers, if I can ask you to move to this side of the room, there's a bit more space here. It will give a bit more space for those at the entrance, inshallah. Please do try and make an effort in honor of the measures of Al-Abbas, alayhi salam, sallallahu alayhi wa ali Muhammad.
Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Even those at the back, if you can try and squeeze up towards your right side as much as you can, then we can have this gap towards the left. In honor of Umm al Banin, salawatullahi wa salamu alayha, aflaha man salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Does he not know that Allah sees all? He is with you wherever you may be. Imagine this. And I don't know if you have speed cameras in Pakistan. I really mean that politely. You do. Do they operate correctly and well? Okay, cool. A genuine question because I've, I've seen some driving here and it's fascinating, right? If you're doing, in the UK, 70 miles per hour is the max on the motorway, right? If you're doing 100 miles per hour on the motorway and suddenly you see a camera, that brake is getting hit hard. Because in the UK, that's gone up to, if I'm not mistaken, a 120 pound fine. And because you've exceeded 100, you may even get a ban on your license immediately. No risks. Even worse, if you see the police guy with a speed gun, you definitely want to stop. Suddenly, the awareness of an enforcer changes your behavior. Allah says, Alam ya'lam Allah yara. Do you not know that Allah sees all? You're about to commit that sin, but you see the speed camera. You're about to commit that sin, but you see Allah. Why is it that the speed camera influences our behavior, but Allah doesn't influence our behavior when we see Him, when we know that He sees us? Muslims know that Allah is present. It's not something that you have to teach individuals. They can feel it. They've experienced it throughout their life. Yes, they may need to unearth it. And we've spoken about that in some of our sessions, either this year or last year, I can't remember. But that inner calling of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is present within all of us. We felt it at some point in our life. The proof for that could be that 99.9% .9 of Muslims in the month of Shah Ramadan, if no one's in this room and I'm sat here, I'm not going to sneak out a quick Lucas aid from the side and have a swig because I know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching me. We all know it. We're just not accepting it. Or we're just not fearful enough of him. Or we just don't understand him enough. Being constantly aware of Allah's presence is critical to caring for our souls. So stick these posters up. Put it on your phone. With respect, forget your partner and your family. Put on there, on the lock of your phone, on that home screen, Allah is watching me and see if it changes your behavior. Someone was asking the other day, how can we sustain this change that we are inspired by Imam Hussain to make in these days? Sometimes you've got to be really practical. I mentioned sometimes even if you buy a ring, you'll feel the weight of it on your hand and maybe that will change your behavior. Put something on your phone. When you unlock it, Allah is watching you. Oof, okay, fair enough. Not going to click on that Instagram account anymore. <laughs> the sisters laughing at that one was a big statement. <laughs> but the brothers and by no means innocent. The second thing that we can do to try and be practical in how we can nurture and look after and nourish the soul is to examine our actions daily. Accountability. Go see any of the shopkeepers here and I'm sure at the end of the day, that till gets opened and they're counting the cash. Why? They need to see, okay, given what I've earned today, if I needed 100 pounds and I only did 90, what's my plan for the next day to make up the 10 quid? Because I know I need it. If I've made 50, God forbid, then how am I going to make up this 50? It's a big, big, big thing that I need to now be aware of. Project management, for those of you in software development, you know that if you have a milestone six months away, technology is known to always run over, not our company, quick plug, but... Okay. They all promise it. But you want to inspect your progress every day. Are we on track? And if not, let's react today rather than in a month's time, rather than in a week's time. I'm sure a lot of you in your businesses have bought software and they tell you three months. You're like, dude, if you know on month one it's going to be late, why didn't you do anything about it? Are you not doing hisab every day? Are you not checking with the team? You didn't know he was going to be on holiday? Like, what are you doing? In the same way, at the end of our day, do some sort of exercise to say, you know what? Am I good or am I not? Am I green or am I red? The Holy Prophet is reported to say, assess your deeds and actions before being called to your final reckoning on the day of judgment. Weigh up your actions before they're presented for evaluation. 
Of course it makes sense. You're gunning for a promotion. They say prepare a dossier to show off your work. You're not going to turn up on the last day and then hope it's going to be okay. You're going to check it three months before, see you've got a couple of gaps, you've not made a sale to an enterprise client yet, or if you're a medic, you've not done uh, an anesthetic yet. Okay, I'm going to make sure that part of my portfolio is covered and then I'm going to go to that judgment day, that examination. You don't turn up blind to your record. If you're seeking investment as a business owner, you don't turn up saying, I think I know my figures. I'll laugh you out the window. Amir al-Mu'minin reported to say, those who keep account of their souls will be aware of their defects, know their shortcomings, and they'll strive to overcome them. And as for those who do not do a daily recounting, our holy seventh Imam, who also shares a beautiful title of Al-Abbas alayhi salam, Bab al-Hawa'ij, Imam al-Kadhim alayhi salam, and a second salawat in honor of the Imam who he resides with in that beautiful shrine of Kadhumiyyah, Imam al-Jawad, Aflaha man salla ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. He discusses those who don't do this daily audit and he's reported to say those who do not carry out an audit of their deeds every day are not one of us. I.e. you're not from the Ahl al-Bayt, you're not from one of our followers. Imagine the importance to say there's very few occasions where the Imam salam say that you're not from us. I think one of them, if I'm not mistaken, is about Salah or you won't receive our intercession. If you don't do daily accounting of yourself, you're not from us. When they perform a good deed, they should ask Allah to enable them to do more. And when they commit an evil deed, they should repent for having committed it and ask Allah to forgive them. You could quite literally keep account. At the end of your day, you could very easily see, okay, am I 15 to the good and 3 to the bad? Okay, how am I going to problem solve and get rid of these three? We've got entrepreneurs in this community, build an app for it. Genuinely, if you want to encourage your children, be like, okay, cool, and even yourselves, build an app to try and get yourself moving on it. Am I good? Am I bad? What did I do? What didn't I do? It may sound daft, but the reality is when you have to write down on a piece of paper or something and say, I was backbiting against Muhammad and his wife, that will speak volumes to you. The Prophet even indicates this to being part of the greater jihad this daily reconciling and there's a beautiful bit of practical advice from Amir al-Mu'mineen he's asked how people are to audit themselves how should they actually go about doing this and he actually provides a very interesting framework quite simple but when you ask those questions to yourself and I'm sure there could be more and less it's quite interesting to see what he comes out with he's reported to say at the end of each day they should address their souls my soul Today has ended and will never return again. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will hold you accountable for what happened during it, what have you done in the last 24 hours? And then you list some questions. Did you remember Allah and praise Him? Did you assist the brother in faith and meet his needs? Did you try to quell his concerns? Did you take care of his family during his absence? Did you prevent him from being slandered? What actions did you take this day? He then recalls the answers to all of the above and then thanks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his ability to respond in full. And if he finds shortcomings, he will seek Allah's pardon and make a firm resolve to make compensation for his failures. Daily hisab, muraqaba. If you're interested, search around the concept of muraqaba. Fascinating as how the Imam have guided us to do this daily accounting. The third practical, very, very simple thing that we can do. Firstly, being aware of Allah's presence and that He can see everything like the speed camera. Secondly, do your daily accounting. Thirdly, and this is a tough one, is to put a laser focus on your shortcomings. We're amazing at spotting everyone else's shortcomings. Phenomenal. Amazing analysts observers, discoverers of the galaxies when it comes to other people's sins, when it comes to other people's shortcomings. But when it comes to myself, suddenly I've got the strongest armor that no laser can pierce. And if there's one advocation for marriage that I would give at this point is that spouses are phenomenal at telling you what you don't want to hear. And that's a way for you to get better. 
True bravery is not when you defeat someone in the battlefield or when you carry a load of boxes from one majlis to another majlis. It's when you recognize and overcome your own faults and failings. You all know of individuals who when they are given feedback, they accept it warmly and they try their best to solve it. You're like, you know what, that's a good individual. And you all know of individuals, and maybe it's myself, that when I'm given feedback, I'm like, yeah, yeah, funny, whatever, you don't even know what you're talking about. And suddenly, when the brother's trying to advise me, I've now done the classic, I know your shortcomings, so I'm not even gonna listen to you. The Holy Prophet's reported to say the fault that lies within a person's self is more than sufficient to prevent them from prying into the faults of others. They appear to be blind regarding their own faults, but blame others for that which they themselves are not able to keep away from. Our mind is so occupied with everyone else, but in fact, if we just occupied it with ourselves, we probably wouldn't have space for anyone else. Switch it. Be frank with yourself. Let your partner tell you, let your children tell you, Dad, you know what? I think you were a bit aggressive in the way you replied. Oh, you don't know what you're talking about, you're just a little kid. Ah, I fell into the trap again. Be honest with yourselves. Let your family and your support structures speak to you and give them the space to have that conversation with you. Three very easy things. Remembering that Allah is present and sees it like the speed camera, which changes your behavior. Stick it on your phone, do something. Don't just leave and not do anything. Try and do something. Secondly, daily accountability. And thirdly, focus. Laser focus on your shortcomings. The Qur'an then gives us an understanding of three characteristics of the soul that I think once we can then take a step back and almost evaluate our soul, what sort of characteristics of our soul are dominating, we can then see in what direction we're heading in. The first is known as Ammara, that which commands satisfaction. Uh, I actually didn't know what the sign said. I think it was an acronym and I had no idea. Date. Ah, date. I thought it said P-A-T-F-S. I genuinely couldn't read it. I've been told to remind you all of dates. Perfect timing before we get to this point. I'm really sorry. It's like when they brought the uh, car registration. I just couldn't read it in time. Uh, dates. You will have not the food dates, but if you want them, we can organize that. You'll have the dates, inshallah, for the rest of our Muharram Majalis, inshallah. Um, a message has been sent out with the screenshot. Alhamdulillah, we've managed by the blessings of Allah through the measure of Imam Hussain alayhi salam to hold the day of Ashura, offering the maqtal and the amal in English and Arabic where necessary. Perhaps you haven't attended a maqtal in English where you can hear the stories of the Yom al Ashura in English. So you're really, really warmly to attend. The details of where that is is all on the poster. That same evening, inshallah, Shah Maghriba will be back here at Salat al Maghrib and then we'll have a farewell majlis on the day after. So if you're not on the WhatsApp group, please ask any of the volunteers or any of the other brothers or sisters or myself and we can get you added so you can have the information. Um, and I think that's all of the dates that we needed to cover. Aflahamad Salah Allah Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. So the Quran refers to the soul having these three different characteristics and we can use that to assess how we're doing. The first is Ammara, that which commands satisfaction of physical appetites and ill desires and encourages them to commit evil deeds. In English we'd call this ego. So when I see someone, for example, doing amazing work and I just want to pull him down, my ego will command me to start rubbishing everything that this individual does. That is Ammara. How much Ammara do we have within our nafs? How active, how bubbling is that? The second is Lawama. This expresses severe disapproval of things and reproaches. And this is known as our conscience. It knows what is right and wrong. It can differentiate between right and wrong. When I see Haram, am I actually seeing it as Haram? Or am I like, I think that's actually okay. How active is my nafs al Lawama? The third stage, which is the peak, is nafs al mutma'inna, that which has been purified and consequently elevated to the state of ultimate tranquility, described by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, content with their Lord, which is also content with them. They've reached a point whereby Allah is content with them and they're content with their Lord. They're untouchable, they're attached to the infinite. 
And maybe that's part of our audit, my dear brothers and sisters. Your milestones could be, I want to have 100% mutma'inna, 0% lawama, 0% ammara. That's your mission as a family. Have a family strategy day out. Honestly, I see so many of these business concepts to make teams work well together. And we invest so much in our leadership team at work. But when it comes to the family, we've never ever taken a day out to say, what is our mission as a family? What are our values as a family? We all want to get 100% mutma'inna. Maybe let's be honest with ourselves. Let's rank each other. I've got maybe 30% amara where I really, really detest individuals. Maybe I've got 40% lawama where, you know what? I don't always see things to be haram when they actually are. And then I've got a remaining 30% that is mutma'inna where I'm actually able to reach those heights in certain moments. And here's the actions that I'm going to take to try and improve this. I'm going to try and do the self-accountability thing. What's the actual action? Well, I'm going to put it on my phone to say Allah is watching me all the time. When are you going to do it? But I'm going to get it done by 6 p.m. today. Okay, and let's check it at 6 p.m. Imagine you have a family construct that is this disciplined on their journey towards Allah. Posters everywhere in the house that signify this. Speaks to us, reminds us. That is a family unit that together can journey towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you want to see a family unit that managed this, that would speak to each other about their Lord, about where they are, and how it was then manifested on a day where they were challenged and they all smashed it. You look towards Ahl al-Bayt and their companions in Karbala. Because in Karbala we learn of a soul that has been nourished outstandingly well. A soul that in fact continues to refine itself even in its last moments. And a man who speaks to his soul and his poem is captured in history. We'll come on to the Masai but I just want to give a, give a description of Al-Abbas beforehand. When this man reaches that water, he stops himself and manages to think of his master Hussein. You see this loyalty, you see this courage, you see this fortitude, you see the chivalry, and you think Abbas. I remember as a child, and I was thinking about it today, I was like, how far back does my memory take me? And I remember I was at primary school, so maximum age I was in that school was eight years old. I remember exactly where it happened actually, in the door back into the main building. And I was holding the door open for a few people, probably not by choice, probably forced by my teacher, I'm not that good kid. And I had, I don't know if you have it in, in Pakistan tradition, the green doro. Do you have this? It's like a green cloth that you put around your wrist, I'm not sure. In the Khoja tradition at least, that back home, what we have is that on the night of Al-Abbas they'll bring out their alam and they'll distribute these green cloths that is almost like a symbol of the flag of Al-Abbas and you tie it around your wrist and then on Yawm Al-Ashura you'll then give it back and it's kind of like a reminder to say Abbas is the flag bearer now I remembered that as a kid whenever I had an exam I remember when I had this really minor surgery on the side of my head for this little spot this green doro, this green cloth would always come out my mother would always tie it on my wrist and I remember that day at school specifically because I was holding the door open and this guy comes up and just starts playing with it. And I was like, this is weird. Like, I don't know what I'm meant to say right now. Like, what is this? I was like, to be honest, I actually don't know. I'm a kid. Like, I've just been told to wear it. And I'm sure we were having exams or something at the time. This same green cloth, whenever we would travel on Ziara, my mum would take it with her. We're really blessed to have mothers that have introduced us into Ahl al-Bayt. Salah ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. It was as if she was saying, you know, oh son, I'm leaving you in the hands of Bab al-Hawaj. You're good, you're covered, don't worry. And I thought maybe, is this just a Khoja tradition? This glorification of Al-Abbas alayhi salam? And then as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave me the opportunity to go and see these other communities in London, I was like, wow. The Khojas, the Iranians, the Lebanese, the Iraqis, the Pakistanis, the this, the that. The night of Abbas is a very unique one.
They're all very unique, but you know what I'm saying. Al Abbas's night is special. Usually we gift out kebab rolls and laddu. Still don't know why, but it was a nice tradition that I just remember as a kid. As I then got older, I then realized just what Al Abbas salam stood for. And I'm sure till I die, inshallah, I'll continue to learn more about this phenomenal man. And may Allah grant us his ziyarah fi dunya and his shafa'a fi akhirah We're told in history that Al Abbas salam is the symbol of love, self-sacrifice, the exemplar of chivalry, sincerity, dignity, and the embodiment of courage, valor, and nobility. Amongst the heroes of Karbala and the martyrs in history, he occupies an elevated and honored rank. In the words of Imam Zain al Abidin, he's reported to say, The status of Al Abbas before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one that will be envied by all the martyrs on the Day of Judgment. He was born from a great mother from the tribe of Banu Kilab, who boasted the bravest warriors of the time. Al Abbas salam, was nurtured by two unmatched brothers, Al Hassan and Al Hussein. The titles of this phenomenal man are Abu Fadl and Abu Qirbah, the bearer of the water skin. His titles include Saqqa, the water bearer, and Qamr Bani Hashim, the moon of the Hashemites. The latter title was given to him because Al Abbas salam, was of tall stature, broad chested, and had strongly muscled arms and a handsome countenance. From the very beginning of the stand of Imam Hussein Al Abbas was a constant companion and supporter of his brother. In the battle itself, he was what we call the Alamdar, the standard bearer of the army. And at a time when a severe restriction was placed on the Imam and his companions, he was charged with ensuring the supply of water to the soldiers and to the children of Ahl al-Bayt On the night of Ashura, when Imam al-Hussein suggested to his companions that they should depart from Karbala and leave him, he was the first to declare his loyalty and readiness to sacrifice with words that resounded with, with love and faith and selflessness. In the words of the Imam Al-Abbas was worthy of praise for his selflessness, foresight, steadfastness in faith, outstanding role in battle, penetrating insight and coveted status on the Day of Judgment. It's said according to history that on Yawm Al-Ashura he was just 34 years old. And in Ziyarat al Nahiyah we say peace be upon Abu Al-Fadl Al-Abbas, the son of Amir al muminin who gave his life in defense of his brother who took the provision for the hereafter from this world, who was loyal and protective over him, who tried hard to bring water to him, and whose two arms were severed. May Allah send the la'an on those two who killed him, Yazid ibn Ruqad al-Hayti and Hakim ibn Tufay al tai when Imam Ali ibn al-Hussein al-Sajjan saw Ubaidullah ibn al-Abbas ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib, tears came to his eyes and he's reported to say, May Allah have mercy on Abbas. Indeed, he displayed selflessness, underwent tribulations and sacrificed himself for his brother until even his arms were severed. In return, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him two wings with which he flies with the angels in paradise just as he gave wings to Ja'far ibn Abu Talib. Indeed, the status of Al-Abbas before God is one that will be envied by all the martyrs on the Day of Judgment. I just wanted to share those short reports from history with you so you can build a picture of this man. Because when we recite his Masaib, sometimes it can feel a little bit too heroic for what this man ended up doing. But in reality, this was just what he was born for. Amir al muminin is said to have asked to find a wife from a tribe that would bring up strong individuals. And a lady known as Fatima, or more commonly known as Umm al Benin, the mother of sons, was the suitor. And from her came four bright moons. Ya Umm al Benin. 
many mothers gave away one son. A handful of mothers gave away two. You, Umm al gave away four. In honor of Umm al and with all of your hajat, the mother of Bab al Hawa'ij, ease her heart in ease her heart in Jannatul al Baqi by reciting a salawat ala Muhammadin wa Ali Muhammad. Ya Abbas. Following the martyrdom of Al Qasim and of Ali and Al Akbar and the companions prior to that, Al Abbas saw the increased casualties of the family. He turned to his brothers from his mother and father, Abdullah, Uthman, and Ja'far, and said to them, Move forward, O sons of my mother, until I see that you have been, until I see. You have given your admonishment seeking the pleasure of Allah and his messenger. He then turned to Abdullah who was older than him. He then turned <coughs> to Abdullah who was older than Uthman and Ja'far and instructed him saying, Go ahead my brother, fight until I see you killed. And I will count you among those who supported the cause of Allah. All three of them went ahead and fought until they were martyred as we discussed a few nights ago. It was at this point when Al Abbas السلام, was unable to remain patient any longer. After witnessing the martyrdom of his companions and family members and seeing Imam Al Hussein in so much difficulty without any supporters and the increasing cries of the women and the children who were weeping from thirst. <laughs> Oh, the thirst, it kills us. He approached his brother and requested permission to fight. Imam al Hussein is reported to reply, saying, Ya Akhi, Anta Sahib Liwa'i, O brother, you are my flag bearer. Abbas alayhi salam is reported to reply, saying, I have lost my patience over these hypocrites. And I want to take my revenge from them. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam ordered him to go and bring some water for the children of Rasulullah. Abbas alayhi salam approached the enemies and admonished them and warned them about the anger of Allah, but it did not make any difference. He'd call out saying, O oh, Amr ibn Sa'ad, this is al Hussein. Son of the daughter of the messenger of Allah You killed his companions and his family members And these are his women and children who are thirsty Give them some water as the thirst is burning their hearts He is even saying let me go to Rome or India And I will leave Hijaz and Iraq for you Shimr la'anatullah alayhi answered him, O son of Abu Turab, if the face of this whole earth was water and it was under our control, we would not have given you even a drop of it until you pledge allegiance to Yazid. Al Abbas returned to his brother Imam al Hussein alayhi salam and informed him of what happened. Al-Abbas alayhi salam would then hear the continued crying from the children with their thirst. So the Hashemite sense of protection and chivalry arose in him and he rode his horse taking the water bag with him and heading straight to Furat. History tells us that 4,000 men surrounded him and shot him with arrows but he was not threatened by them nor their numbers. He attacked them with his sword until the men dispersed allowing him to reach the cold water 
water for art. He arrived at the water and took some of it in his hand to drink from it. What an innocent thing to do. But then he remembered the thirst of Hussein and the thirst of the family members of Rasulullah. Look at the control of this nafs. So he threw the water back into the river and recited these famous lines of poetry. Ya Abbas, Ya Nafsu Min Ba'din Hussein Huni. Oh my soul, after Hussein, be in disgrace. وَبَعْدَهُ لَا كُنْتِ إِن تَكُونِ For him, for after him you better not be. هَذَا الْحُسَيْنُ وَارِدُ الْمَنُونِ This is Hussein arriving at death. وَتَشْرَبِينَ الْبَارِدَ الْمَعِينِ And you drink the cold water. تَاللَّامَ هَذَا فِعَارَ by Allah, this is not the teachings of my religion. Nor is it the action of one with truthful intentions. No, this is Al Abbas السلام, controlling that soul. You and I can take lessons from this that when we're tempted with that temptation, speak to your soul, address it, explain why this is wrong. Abbas السلام, would fill the bag with water, he would mount his horse with only one destination in mind to head back towards the camp with the women and the children thirsty for water for days however Ya Abbas his path was intercepted by the enemies he attacked them and struck them with his sword killing many of them. He dispersed them from his path while reciting the following lines of poetry until I make the swords meet one another. Myself is a defense for the self of the pure grandson of Al-Mustafa. Indeed, I am Al Abbas bringing the water, not fearing death when I meet it. Zayd ibn al Ruqad al Johani then would hide behind a tree. O oh, Mu'min in grief for Al Abbas. <laughs> Let those tears flow for Al Abbas. Do not hold anything back tonight. <laughs> He would hide behind a tree and strike Al Abbas on his right hand and sever it. <laughs> Al Abbas السلام, then took the sword into his left hand and oh, he attacked them while proclaiming, I swear by Allah that if you cut off my right hand, I will surely remain defending my religion and the Imam with the truthful intentions. The grandson of the Prophet, the purified, the honest, he did not worry about losing his right hand as his main concern was to get the water to the women and the children of Hussein. At this moment, O Mu'mineen, Ajarakumullah, Hakim ibn al-Tufail hid behind a tree and when Abbas would pass him, he struck him on his left hand, cutting it off as well look Abbas speaks to his soul again oh my soul do not fear the non-believers and blare the glad tidings of the mercy of the almighty with the prophet the master and the chosen indeed they cut my left hand through their acts of oppression my lord punished them in the hellfire the enemies then would surround Abbas from all sides they would bombard him with their arrows one arrow would pierce the water bag and the water would spill out from it 
words I ask you, Abbas, what hurts more? Was it when you saw your arms were no more? When you saw the wood water not to reach Sukaina? Another arrow would pierce the chest of Abbas. <laughs> Another arrow would pierce the chest of Abbas, while additional one would strike into his eye. <laughs> then a man would hit Al-Abbas with a post from a tent and wounded him even further, causing him to fall to the ground. <laughs> The mind just asks this question when you get off a horse. <laughs> you need your arms. <laughs> How does Ambas alayhi salam fall to the floor from the horse with no arms? <laughs> He calls out saying, Alayka minni salam, Ya Aba Abdillah. Upon you be my greetings, Aba Abdillah. And Abbas says to his master, Adrikni, Ya Akhi, come to my help, oh my brother. Abbas was born to serve his master and now he said, Edrikni ya akhi, come and help me. Imam Al-Hussein rushes near to him. He sees him with no hands and an arrow in his eye and he cries. Al-an, in kasr al-dhahri, now my back is broken. وقلت حيلتي والشمت بي عدوي my resources have declined and my enemies are mocking me <laughs> when our Imam alayhi salam went near Abu Fadl he asked him such a difficult question Al-Abbas asks Imam al Hussein, imagine, you know, if you want to understand servitude, even in this moment, you say, you know what, Al-Abbas, at this moment, let your brother do what he wants to do. You don't need to serve him anymore. You've done enough. Even in this last moment, history tells us that as Imam al Hussein would come close to Al Abbas, uh, with Abbas having no hands and the arrows in his body, that he will still say to his Mawla, Sayyidi, ma turidu an tasna my master, what do you want to do with me? Imam al Hussein replies, Uridu an ahmilaka ila al mukhayyam. I want to carry you back to the camp. <laughs> al Abbas requests him to leave him next to the river. Abbas, it doesn't tell me in these pages why you wanted to be left at the river. Why you did not want to head back to the tents. But perhaps, given that you went to get water for Sukaina, perhaps because you went to get water for Ali and Al Azhar, perhaps that you went to get water for Zaynab and Umm Kulthum and Imam Al Sajjad and Imam Al Husayn, that you did not want to return empty handed. Shortly after the soul departs from Al Abbas while he was resting in the lap of Imam Al Husayn, Imam Al Husayn returns back to the camp alone, broken hearted in grief and crying, Ajarakumullah ya Mawlaya ba Abdullah, wiping his tears with his sleeve while the enemy started marching towards the tent. He cries, Is there a helper to help us? Is there a defender to defend us? Is there one seeking the truth to support us? Is there anyone who fears the hellfire will fight for us? 
The innocent young girl, Sunkaina, then goes to her father. Eyes. <laughs> She would ask her father Hussein about Uncle Ambas. <laughs> and how does Hussein tell his daughter? He told her the news about his martyrdom. And when Zainab is, she shouts, she shouts, Wa Akha, oh brother, Wa Abbas. We are lost after you, O oh Ambas. All of the women wept, and Imam and Hussein cried with them and said, We are lost after you. <laughs> but my dear brothers, after the death of Ambas, the Maqtal tells us. Then Hussein would look around and see no 